What does Pat Fryermuth have to do to become an elite NFL tight end? We'll talk about that here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, joined today by Alan Saunders of SteelersNow.com. It's going to be a fun episode. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, welcome to the Locked On Steelers podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, bringing you your daily dose of all things on the Pittsburgh Steelers. As always, you can find this show on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of your daily Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. We thank you for making us your first listen every day because we're your team every day. And today's episode is sponsored by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on on NFL to post your job for free terms and conditions apply more on that later we've got our man Alan Saunders back on the show he's from SteelersNow.com y'all know him y'all love him he's always on the show Alan it's great to have you back gotta talk to you about Pat Fryermuth though because I think that there is he's one of the younger Steelers players that Steelers fans are excited about and I think national people are excited about because that doesn't always correlate. There's national people that think that Kenny Pickett's not going to be that good. There's national people that think Najee Harris isn't going to be that good. There's national people that think that Minka Fitzpatrick isn't really all that all that too special. Like he's talented, but he's not that important. There's national people that think that TJ Watt isn't a top three edge rusher in the NFL. But Pat Fryer all is all, 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 all bad. There's these all bad. bad players. Awful. Just all bad. There's, there's no way any of these guys are talented. But <laughs> Pat Fryermuth is a guy who I see getting more respect from people around the league. Pro football focus in the in my crosshairs here as far as this conversation. They ranked UV. <coughs> excuse me. There we go. I was trying to hold on to that so bad. But they ranked their top tight ends in the NFL. Uh, I think going all the way down to their top 15. And they ranked it by three different tiers. Tier one was elite with the top three players. Tier two was great with potential to become elite with about four players. And Pat Fryermuth was on that second tier of players, ranked at number six behind. <coughs> excuse me. I don't know where this is coming from. Uh, TJ Hawkinson with the Vikings at five. Dallas Goddard with the Eagles at four. And then in tier one, it was Kittle with the Niners at three. Mark Andrews with the Ravens at two. And of course, Travis Kelsey with the Chiefs at one. One, Alan, do you think that that is a legitimate ranking for Pat Fryermuth? And two, what do you want to see from him this year that you think will make him climb up that list, that list a lot? I really agree with the tier title, great with the potential to become elite. I think that really fits Pat Fryermuth well. Um, the weird thing is, is that I don't think it fits the other people in that tier that well. Like, hmm. I mean, Dallas Goddard and TJ Hawkinson are kind of who they are. I don't think those are guys that we should expect big improvements for. They are great. I don't see the potential to become elite with those guys. And Kyle Pitts, right behind Farmers, obviously has the potential to become elite, but I don't think we've even seen great from him. So, like, I kind of agree that like, he's great. He's great right now. He's not elite. He is great. He belongs in that realm, right, that 5 to 10 realm in terms of tight ends. I, I I think that, but like, I really think if you want to really nitpick the wording here, great with potential to be elite to me only really applies to Farmouth. I, I think Pitts has more potential than he does, especially as a receiver. Um, but I don't see potential in guys. I mean, how old is Dallas Goddard? How, how old are, are is TJ Hawkins? I mean, these guys are not young players anymore, you know, where I'm, I'm looking at them as ascendant. You know, I think of these guys of are great tight ends, but I, I don't think they're going to become more than that. I think Fryermuth, if you look at that group of Kelsey, Andrews, and Kittle, like who could realistically join that group sometime soon? I think really the only two answers are Kyle Pitts and Pat Fryermuth. Hmm. No, I hear you on that. And I actually, actually I agree. I do feel like uh Goddard and Hawkinson are kind of who they are. Now, I will say this about Hawkinson is that he did switch teams last year 
maybe if he clicks with Kirk Cousins a little bit sooner with the with the talent they have at receiver, Justin Jefferson, they've added Jordan Addison, maybe he gets a little bit bigger numbers and we see him do some real damage. He did have a hundred plus or a hundred plus target season uh, twice in his career. Uh, where he got close to a thousand yards uh, last year, and he was traded from the Lions to uh, the Vikings. But you bring up a good point. They both been around. Goddard joined the league, or excuse me, Hawkinson joined the league in twenty in twenty nineteen. He's twenty six years though, a little bit younger, but still uh, a guy that has been around the league quite some time. Dallas Goddard has been with the league since twenty eighteen, and he's twenty eight years old. Um, so. I he- I hear you entirely on on that on that account and Pat Frymuth guy this is going to be his third season he's still 24 he'll be 25 uh in you know 25 uh in October so this is a guy who I agree fits that mold of being great with the potential to be elite he has we still haven't seen a lot from him and I think of all the players um he has legitimate reason, a legitimate reason why his numbers could explode more than the other guys. On top of his talents, he played his first year with an old Ben Roethlisberger, his second year with a rookie Kenny Pickett who came in the middle part of the season. This will be his first year that he's had a young, athletic quarterback who knows their system, knows the system, who can build a rapport with him going into the season. And I think that could be a big part of what does get his numbers to shine a bit more so that he can be a bigger playmaker and move his way up that list into the elite category or the elite tier. Yeah. And I mean, when you look at that elite tier, like, okay, Travis Kelsey is so good and Pat yeah. and, and his quarterback is so good, right? Like even if Friar was as good as Travis Kelsey, which he's not, and he's probably never going to be, Kenny Pickett isn't going to be as good as Patrick Mahomes. Like let's just set that aside sort of as like, okay, that's sort of unreasonable. George Kittle, I think, to me, provides a level of blocking that just Frymuth is never going to. He is a tougher, bigger, more physical player, and I just think that he will always have that that rises his baseline to a point that is is pretty high. But like, if I look at a guy like Mark Andrews and what Mark Andrews has been for Lamar Jackson, like Lamar Jackson has been a great quarterback, but he hasn't necessarily been an elite passer while he's been a great quarterback. Mm. And Mark Andrews has been a huge part of Lamar Jackson getting to where he is as a quarterback, I really think that Fryermuth could be that guy for Kenny Pickett. I mean, I think they're pretty similar in size and, and build and in sort of talent. And I I really do think that there's nothing really st- – like, what, what's the big holdup? You know, what, what would be the thing that would keep him from reaching that, especially when you look at what he's already done in three seasons with, as you said, pretty – I'm sorry, two seasons with pretty mediocre quarterback play. Like, I think he can be a lot better. I think he can be a Mark Andrews-like player. And the thing that was really the big selling point on him coming out of Penn State was his play in the red zone. And I think he's been fine in the red zone, but I don't think he's been some sort of, like, elite weapon there. Uh, The Steelers' offense as a whole has struggled in the red zone. I think he can be even better. Like, there are places where he can get better, and I definitely think that he can be a Mark Andrews-type player for Kenny Pickett the way Andrews is for Lamar Jackson and absolutely work his way into that elite tier. I think that's a great way to put, put it right now with, with where, where he is. And it's funny that you bring that up. We actually talked about that with uh, Mike DeFabo of the athletic just, just last week on, on the show, he talked about how the Steelers red zone offense ranked 22nd last year. And that's something that has to improve. And if it does improve, it makes them such a better team. Like uh, we're talking about the average field goal drive being, you know, maybe, maybe about like, you know, 25% of those are more resulting in, in some touchdowns. You, if, if they can average four more points a game, you know, that, you know, that, that could be a situation that leads to them being a decent offense. This, this, this upcoming year, I've brought that up a lot. And Pat Fryermuth, if he can be a red zone guy, or Kenny Pickett, I think back to that touchdown that he scored in Cleveland against the Browns uh, in Ben's last season. That was a ridiculous kind of just bring it to himself, one-handed catch with a guy hanging onto his body. Those type of things, if he can be that for Kenny Pickett, it will make this offense a lot better. I want to address a couple more things on this topic and take some of your calls here on the Locked on Steelers podcast. Don't go anywhere. We're going to 
We have a lot more to talk about this show with Alan Saunders. But first, before we do anything else, I want to talk to you guys about our great sponsors at Bird Dogs. Now, if you don't know about Bird Dogs, first of all, get your life together because they're a great clothing company that has some great deals for you to, to take advantage of right now. And they give you some great options in the summer with some awesome shorts. They use these stretch khaki shorts that are designed to fit slimmer on you through the thigh and the leg, giving you a truly sculpted look when you're going out so you can look good. Bird Dogs do the, do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit a lot better. And they fit better than regular shorts because a lot of shorts are made with stiff, restricting cotton. cotton. Well, Bird Dogs have fixed that issue by using cloud knit fabric that looks just like khakis but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit and you're never sacrificing movement which is so important when you want to be active in the summer bird dogs also use anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long go to birddogs.com slash locked on nfl and when you make your order you can get a free yeti tile yeti style tumbler with your order that's birddogs.com slash locked on nfl for a free yeti style tumbler you won't want to take your bird dogs off We promise you. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Alan Saunders of SteelersNow.com. Alan, just wrapping up this point here about about Pat Frymuth, last year, he did have more yards, but less touchdowns than his, than his rookie season. He wound up with 732 receiving yards, but two touchdowns. The year before, he had 497 receiving yards for seven touchdowns. Um, he was he also this year he had 98 targets, caught 63 of them. Uh, the year before, 79 targets for 60 catches. What's a what's a, a realistic stat line for a successful year look like for Pat Frymuth? That's an interesting question because I think, you know, the way that they're going to use him in the offense is still a little bit up in the air. We've talked before about how I think Darnell Washington could be a player that moves Pat Frymuth into the slot more um, and, and lets them use him more as a receiver instead of being that, you know, he had a lot of reps last year where he was in line with his hand in the ground next to a tackle and getting that little chip in before he would go run his route because the Steelers really didn't trust their offensive line. And I think having a better offensive line and having Darnell Washington is way better suited for that role, but is also still a good receiving threat. I think that really lets them be a little bit more creative on how they use Friar mm. And so I really think he's a player that we could see a big increase in his number of targets. Like I, I think he was under targeted last year, even mm. though, they went way up from his rookie year. Like I, I think they could have used him more in the passing game and used him a little bit less as a blocker. We'll see how aggressive they want to get with that. It probably depends on how fa- quickly Darnell Washington comes along as like a mid round rookie. You know that some of them are great and ready to go day one, and some of them take some time. So we'll see. But I really think there's an opportunity here for those those numbers to explode. Like if we're talking about fantasy football. I am really buying Pat Fryermuth as a fantasy football player this year because I think he is going to be way undervalued compared to how often they're going to use him in the passing game. Um, you know, he had 98 targets last year, I think. Um, mm-hmm. So let's call it 100. And, and I believe that was like up from 70 or 80, something like that, his rookie year. I mean, if he gets to 120, 125 targets – which is just sort of continuing that projection progression and then add some more touchdowns, like gets back into the seven to 10 touchdown range. Like that's a big number in terms of fantasy football tight ends. And I think it's realistic. Like it doesn't feel like, as I said before, like what would be the thing that is holding him back? I guess Matt Canada, if you're like really not believing in, in the Steelers offense, maybe you just don't think they have enough plays to go around where where he could get that many. But that's really the only thing that I see is like a big holdup from keeping this from happening. I could I could I agree with you. There's uh there could be a hold up there with play calling. There could be a hold up there with a young offense figuring out what they wouldn't want to do in the passing game. But I think Pat Frymuth has the talent and that's another reason why I think it's up to Matt Canada to figure some things out with this offense if he wants to keep a job as offensive coordinator in the NFL. 
as as always, we do take your calls here on the Locked On Steelers podcast. Remember, at any point in time, you can call 412-223-6644. Leave your name, where you're from, and keep your question under a minute. We'll try to get you on the show as soon as possible. Also, if you donate $10 to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation campaign we've been running with the link attached to this podcast or the QR code that you see on screen, you can get your question guaranteed to be answered on the air. Sometimes we can't answer questions because we're busy or they might, they might, they might, uh, you know, we might not have to be able to stack it in. But we will guarantee your question is answered on air if you if you make a donation. But let's get to our latest question. This comes from Anthony at Atlanta, Georgia, who has a question about some of the guys who can be more versatile on the Steelers roster. Hi, this is Anthony from Atlanta, Georgia. My question is about um, is it possible that we could have some position changes? Um, I've been hearing that Spencer Anderson did try uh, some snaps at right tackle and OTAs, and uh, also. Nick Herbig maybe move into inside linebacker? Is that something that you think he could potentially do? Um, I do know that he was in coverage, I think, 42 times last year and had three pass deflections. And I was just thinking, you know, that being the biggest uh, need on the defense as a coverage linebacker, if that was maybe something that he could he could do or sub in a couple times for. <clears throat> Thanks. So, first of all, thank you, Anthony, for your question. We always appreciate people who call in to our – uh, our locked on Steelers hotline there, but um, you know, let's 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 get into this a, a little bit, Alan. Um, first of all, let's talk about Nick Herbig because um, you know he was a fourth round pick for the Steelers out of Wisconsin, another Wisconsin de- defender, and don't have any of those, right? They, they totally don't Very have rare. like tw- twelve of them. Um, but uh, but looking at Nick Nick Herbig and what he was able to do for Wisconsin, this was a guy who had a lot of athletic skills. He was able to get 11 sacks this past year, seven sacks the year the year before that. Um, and uh, when you when you do look at his his production, he officially had five pass breakups in his career at Wisconsin. Um, but uh, so you know, maybe a little bit there. But I, I do look at his athleticism and think. This guy could move around a little bit here, but I also think that the Steelers, maybe his first year being a fourth round pick, they might let him just get settled in at at, at rusher, or who knows? Maybe they say, "Hey, go settle in at, as one of the depth off ball linebackers." What do you think is the approach that the Steelers take on Herbig? Well, I think you know. Look at edge rusher, right? You have clearly T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith. Mm-hmm. You have Marvin Leal, who's going to play there at least some of the time, if not most of the time. You have Marcus Golden, and then you have some guys like Quincy Roche who are special teamers, right? If Nick Kirby is an outside linebacker, he's a bit part player, right? He's a guy that you're going to use at most four, five, or six snaps a game, unless some people get hurt, right? That's that's it. He will not bit play a major role on this team as an outside linebacker this year. It's just not going to happen. I think that long term inside linebacker is probably a better fit for his skill set. Hmm. And is obviously, as as our caller said, a bigger need for the team. Um, but I don't think the Steelers are in a big hurry to move him there, especially after what we just saw. I mean, look, they're one season removed from losing TJ Watt at Edge Rutter and being like, yeah. oh my gosh, like what happens? Like Malik Reed and Jameer Jones played a whole lot last year. I don't think they're ready to cannibalize that depth. Unless what they see that what ha- is happening at inside linebacker, you know, they have a lot of new there, right? They have Landon Roberts, they have Holcomb, they have Mark Robinson is a guy that probably want to see a little bit of uh, bringing Nick Kwiatkowski and Tanner Muse, guys with NFL experience. Like, there's a lot going on there. I don't really see a reason right now to just snatch them from one spot and plug them into the other. But I do think, and I have thought, that long term, he's probably a better fit as an, an off-ball linebacker than he is like a traditional Steelers inside linebacker or outside linebacker. He just does not have – I mean, think about this, right? So sure. Nick Herbig is 6'2", and he it has like – I don't know what his arm length is. But I don't remember seeing a specific – let's just say 31 30, inches somewhere in there. 30, 31 and a quarter is his official oh. arm length. The Steelers moved Lawrence Timmons inside. He was six foot and had 33 arms, 33 mm-hmm. inch arms. Like, there's a lot of similarity there in terms of body type. 
And the Steelers were pretty quick about saying, oh, yeah, this guy's an inside linebacker. So I, I think I just I, – if they want him to eventually be a starter, if they think he has starter potential, I think he needs to move to inside linebacker. If they think he's just going to be a guy who plays special teams and can give you 10, maybe 15 snaps if you really need him, then he's fine as a rotational edge rusher guy that can just kind of be there. It's interesting you made the Lawrence Timmons comparison because I have the relative athletic score comparison between the two of them over here. I didn't think to, <laughs> I, I didn't think to, to screenshot it real quick. Um, I'm actually I'll try to do that as I'm as I'm talking here so we can put it on screen for our YouTube viewers. But um, actually, when it comes to linebackers, according to relative athletic scores. Herbig has a higher grade than Lawrence Timmons. And this is not to say that he's going to be better than Lawrence Timmons at, at, at linebacker. Um, uh, who knows? Maybe he will be. Um, but uh, but when looking at their scores, Herbig has an 8.07. Timmons has a 7.82. Uh, and that's a slight difference there. And again, relative, relative athletic scores are just athletic scores. They're not you know, they're not guarantees on how they're going to play. And here we go. I think I'm going to be bringing up here. But uh, when you look at these numbers that I'm bringing up on screen now, uh, Herbig, about, about one and a half inches taller. Um, he didn't, we don't have arm and hand measurements for Lawrence Timmons, but uh, Herbig measured, measured 30, 33 inch arms for Lawrence Timmons. 30, oh, yeah, that's right. You said that. So, yeah. so, uh, so his arms a little bit shorter, but height a little bit taller a little bit heavier they did the same exact bench press lawrence timmons ran a 4.7 on the 40 yard dash uh herbig ran a 4.65 um and was uh was faster in each level of the of the splits um the one thing that lawrence timmons had that Herbig didn't in his testing was explosiveness uh, because he was able to edge him out a little bit at the vertical vertical jump, but he blew him out of the water in the broad jump, um, which goes to more that I think Lawrence Timmons was more of an edge, even in just how he measured because explosiveness is a huge part of that. He also uh, did better in the three cone drill um, and in the, the shuttle drill. So those elements of Lawrence Timmons were better, but I, I agree. You look at this and, and the things that you want out of your linebacker, uh, Herbie has good speed. That's the other thing. Like, you know, 4.7 as far as a 40 yard dash for Lawrence Timmons. Lawrence Timmons was not slow. Like, Lawrence Timmons no. was a very good athlete for the Steelers yeah. in the middle part of their defense. I, I like the idea of being sneaky with Nick Herbig and maybe comparing him to a Timmons in that situation. Yeah. I mean, Timmons, more explosive athlete. That's why he's a first round pick and Herbig was a fourth round pick, right? Right. Like, I mean, you have that there. But I, I just think the arm length to me is the big thing. If you can, if you can. Like the Steelers could have used Lawrence Timmons as an outside linebacker. He obviously was talented enough that he could have done it, mm -hmm. especially if you can limit those situations where he's playing to mostly passing downs, right? Because now speed rush becomes an option. Spin move becomes an option. Things where we're taking that long arm out of the equation. I think where it really becomes an issue is could he hold up against the Baltimore Ravens or the Cleveland Browns at the point of attack in the running game? And I just don't feel that I have that faith in a guy that size with short arms yeah. that he would be able to do that. And so if you can't trust him to play the run against run-heavy teams, he's really not that useful mm -hmm. as – I mean, to, to, to me, to find a linebacker with that size that has done that, you need someone that looks like James Harrison. Yeah. Right? You, and just – Nick is not that guy. Like, he, no. he's not. He's – you know, stronger than me, but he's not James Harrison, right? And nobody is. Like, that guy's a freak for a reason. Right. But, like, I, I just don't see the long-term fit. Again, 10 or 15 snaps, play some special teams, go run down on kickoff. I think he's going to be great at that, by the way. Yeah. Um, awesome. Be a good contributor for mid-round pick. If they want him to become a starter, I think they've got to move him to, to off-ball linebacker, or maybe, like, just do a little bit of both. You know, he could be an off-ball linebacker that plays outside a little bit. We've seen that work with Leal, and I think that's you – know, we're going to get into this more, but I think there's something to you, – you know, we see all the specialization, and the specialization is important, but having guys that can do more than one little piece of, of the scheme is very useful. And so I don't think there's a reason for the Steelers right now to just be like, oh, he doesn't have a future as a starting mm. outside linebacker, so let's move him. Like, I think they're in a good place with him where he is right now for him to be able to contribute this rookie year. 
we'll certainly see that. Well, I want to get to the Spencer Anderson part of uh, Anthony's question and then also get to another point that you're kind of hammering on here with the Marvin Leal and her and the potential of her being and what could be the future of NFL defenses. We'll get to all that in a minute here on the Locked on Steelers podcast. Don't go anywhere. I'm Chris Carter. He's Alan Saunders. But first, before we do anything else, I want to talk to you guys about LinkedIn. LinkedIn is one of our great sponsors here on the Locked On NFL Podcast Network. And for the Locked On Steelers Podcast, this is a reminder that when you're being when you're an employer and you're looking for, for new hires out there, but you want something to help you with the process, you go to LinkedIn right now and it'll be there for you the way it's there for millions. Of, of people who, who are looking for jobs every single day. You can create a free job post on in minutes on LinkedIn jobs to cre- reach your network and beyond the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Back here on the Locked On Steelers podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Alan Saunders of SteelersNow.com. Let's touch the Spencer Anderson part of this, Alan, because Spencer Anderson was a draft pick. He's a seventh-round draft pick for the, for the Steelers who came in with the experience to play all five positions on the offensive line. Granted, he's a seventh-round pick. They've invested in this offensive line. That's not going to just be easy to just plug and play and get and get a spot in this in this group and you think the Steelers keep either nine or ten guys for for the season and they have a bunch of guys who have either started or have been brought in to be immediate replacement for those starters um I think it's going to be an interesting battle for that depth chart but I I think it's going to be a serious even even more interesting battle to see how serious can Spencer Anderson put force the issue but we know one thing about Mike Tomlin it's that he loves guys who could fit multiple roles. If Spencer Anderson can play legitimately all over the place, or you know, Anthony was talking about him playing some at right tackle uh, in, in in practices. If Spencer Anderson is able to do that, is he guaranteed a spot on this team? Well, I I mean, I think we should just consider Spencer Anderson a tackle. I mean, first of all, he mm-hmm. played more tackle than anywhere else when he was in Maryland. Second of all. The Steelers could go sign a guy for like $2 million a year as a free agent at guard, and I'm not sure it would make the team right now. Like they are just extremely deep at guard. You have Samalu and Daniels and Dotson and Herbig, and there is no room for literally anyone else that could possibly fit in there to get any reps at guard. So if Spencer Anderson makes his team, it's going to be as a backup tackle and maybe as also a backup center. He played 382 snaps at center. Most of that came in 2021, so it's semi-recent. It's not like it's ancient history. Um, we didn't see a lot of him at center in OTAs and minicamp, but I think center is probably the place where he has the easiest path to making the team. If you look at who's there, you know, the tackles, obviously, depending on what happens at left tackle, one of Dan Moore or Broderick Jones or Chuksakor for is going to be the swing tackle backup. You have a little Raven Clark, who's a veteran, been there, done that kind of guy who's right now at the number four. At center, it's Mason Cole and Kendrick Green, which nobody thought was a good idea last year. I'm not sure that anybody thinks is a good idea right now. So there is, to me, the op- the place for him to make the team, I think, is at center or a tackle. Um, I, I just can't see him making the team as a guard. I do think if he can be both of those, that that helps. You know, the, the, the Steelers like to have that last offensive lineman be somebody that can do multiple things. But to me, really – it's he's got to be one of those and, and we didn't really see him at center at all. So I think we should be looking at him as can he beat out Raven Clark to be the number four tackle? I think he can. Uh, we'll see if he does. And if not, then do they make that decision in enough time to move him over to center and see what he can do against Kendrick Green? It's certainly, I think that, you know, with the, with the way the Steelers have set them, themselves up in the offensive line, you know, Spencer Anderson, maybe a couple years ago, is has a much better shot to get in some action. Last year, forget a couple years ago. Last yeah. year, 
Good point. Last year, he would have had a much, much more open door. This year, you have your solidified starters. You have Broderick Jones, Dan Moore Jr. as uh, as guys you can swap around on at, at left tackle. Um, but you also have signed got backups that are legitimate, like Herbing and Clark, who know what they are. You still have Kevin Dotson at guard, like you brought up. Kendrick Green didn't dress at all last year, but he's at least a guy who's started in the NFL it's not going to be an easy road for Spencer Anderson, but I do think he's an intriguing piece to have on your offensive line. And that leads to this question that I have for you, Alan. Is the NFL working more of itself to a place where players' positions don't matter as much? It, and that's not to say they won't matter at all because there's always going to be quarterbacks. There's always going to be receivers. There's going to be guys like that. But the way that like DeMarvin Leal gets used by the Steelers, the way that the Steelers, you know, want to be able to use different players and the way that other teams use, you know, guys in the slot that are, who are just kind of just slot safety guys, but they can kind of do all these different roles. There's a lot of change. I think that it always happens in the NFL, but people ask the question is positionless football becoming a thing. And I want to get your take on that. I think positionless is the wrong word for it. I think what we're actually seeing is a hyper specialization. I think we're getting okay. to a point where you, know, you don't have cornerbacks. And, and a few years ago, you might have, oh, he's a boundary corner or he's a slot corner. Mm. You know, now it's like, oh, this guy is a run down slot corner. This guy is a pass down slot corner. This guy is a nickel or dime coverage corner that is also going to play in the slot. Right. And so the thing I think that doesn't matter anymore is like there are all these jobs. Right. To me, those are like more jobs than positions almost. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, what is your job on the team? And I think that matters more than the position that's listed next to your name in the roster. And a lot of times those jobs cross positional lines. Let's look at a guy like Keanu Neal. Keanu Neal is going to ask to be a box strong safety. When they want to go eight men in the box and they want a traditional strong safety, he's going to fill that role. Sometimes he's going to play linebacker as a nickel. Sometimes he's going to play slot corner as a big run stopping slot corner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are three jobs. Okay. He's going to do all three of those jobs. What position you give him to me is irrelevant. And so I think the, the name of the position. Yeah. But I don't think we're positionless. And I think there is still a tremendous value and guys that can do multiple jobs. We've seen that with, especially if you want to focus on the Steelers secondary, in the ability to have guys where you're not giving away your intentions by them being on the field. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have a guy that can only do one job, then the other team knows what that guy is going to do because he's out there. If you have Rob Spillane on the field, Rob Spillane is only good at stopping the run. He wasn't a very good pass rusher, wasn't a very good cover guy. If Rob Spillane is on the field, he is a run-stopping linebacker. So the offense, the other the offense, is 41 is going to be focused on stopping the run because that's all he does. Okay. Now, if you have a player like uh, – like Ryan Shazier, okay, mm -hmm. sideline to sideline run stopper, could carry a guy in coverage, was a good, pretty good pass rusher, extremely fast, right? Mika Fitzpatrick. What would you say Mika Fitzpatrick's position is? I mean, he's listed as a roster, it's safety, but like that's a pretty broad job. Like he's going to be a center field safety where he's in cover one or cover three and responsible for that center field. He's going to be a half field safety mm -hmm. in cover two or cover four where he, you know, he has a bigger role. He's going to be a robber. In, in, in like cover three or, or variations of cover two where he's going to sit in a little zone in the middle of the field and try to take something away. He's going to be a man-to-man -man slot corner. He's going to be a blitzer. He's going to be a run stopper. Like Minka Fitzpatrick has nine jobs, and that's what makes Minka Fitzpatrick an all-pro. And not only can he do a lot of them because he's so good at taking the ball away, the quarterback – now has to not only does he not know what Minka Fitzpatrick is doing, he actually has to check and be like, yeah. what is 39 doing before I throw this ball because I need to know. And so I don't think we're seeing positionless football. I think we're seeing specialization. And then we're seeing great players show the ability to do multiple jobs. But sometimes those jobs cross the traditional boundaries of what we call a position. Like Cam Hayward is, is a great example of this too. Like yeah. What position is Cam Hayward? I, I don't know. Like he's a defensive lineman. That's that's yeah. the best one I've got for him. He but plays, he lines up everywhere. He he's he on the inside. Tag, he's on the he outside. Four eye plays some five yeah. tag. Every once in a while, he's all the way out at seven. Like what? I don't know. He's just a defensive lineman. He does mm -hmm. lots of jobs. 
good players are going to do more jobs. They're going to do jobs that overspilled the traditional boundaries of their role. And then you're going to have other guys that are highly specialized. They're going to have to be, you know, it's like a platoon player in baseball, right? He only hits lefties, right? Like there's, there's going to be those guys as well. And so I think that's the direction we're heading, especially on defense. I think offense is still a lot more kind of put into those, those roles in those sort of position rooms. Like I, mm-hmm. I think it's a tough job right now. If you're a defense, like how do you divide up your defense, your defenders into room? Like, do you want your, yeah, like the question. job of the boundary corner is so different than the job of like, like the dip, like what the Steelers were asking Art Millette to do was nothing like what the Steelers were asking uh, Levi Wallace to do last year. Like you, like they don't belong in the same position room really. Okay. Right. And if you look at a guy like Elijah Riley, like some days they were asking him to do Minka's job. Some days they're asking him to do Terrell Edmonds' job. Some days they're asking him to do Art Millett's job. Like, what, which room? <laughs> I think some of it is difficult from that. But I, I just think it is not positionless. I think it is just that we're seeing some some give and take between a job and a position and how much those terms really mean. And, and I just still think, you know, the really good players, the ones you want, they're the ones that can do a lot. And it doesn't really matter what you call. I, I, I like the way that you approach this because I, I think that is also a better way to go. You're right. Positionless is not the best term, but a, a hyper focus on what their role is. And, and I think it's just that people have gotten so fixed into what a position is, right? Like, you know, the average person, they play Madden and they, and they think, okay, you're this, you're that, you're a, you're, you're an, a, a middle linebacker. Like, for example, one thing that one of the first things I talk with the Steelers fans about, like, who plays middle linebacker? Like, nobody. There's no such yep. thing as a middle Every linebacker. Time, that's right. it. Right. There, but there's inside linebackers. There's off ball linebackers. But there, but that's that's not a role. And I think people get so fixated on certain roles because that's just the way they were taught the game. But in today's NFL, there are so and in college sports too. It's not just the NFL. I think well, everything comes sports. from college. Like all this started at college football, where you see right. three, three, five defenses and people playing the base nickel and coming up with their own position names. Like in Michigan, you know, uh, they have a viper, right? At, at at Pitt, they have a money, right? Like they're just creating their own. It's all the same stuff, right? They're just calling it something else. No, I agree that that's the that I think that's the whole thing here is that they're calling it different things, but these different things that they keep inventing, they're inventing to counter different things that offenses do. And that's where it could get really interesting with how football sh- strategy evolves over the next, let's say, 10 years. And, you know, what if, if there's a position that we don't really identify with right now, that could be, like, you know, a linebacker who covers slots specifically or, or you know, defensive linemen who you know, who, who drop back into coverage a, a bit, a bit more, you know, what are those roles and how are they explained? I think that that's one of, one of the things that we're dealing with here. So to get back to Anthony's question about the guys who have versatility, I think that's a huge part of what's coming up in today's game. And I think that more and more, you're going to see the Steelers get more guys that can play roles like that so that they can move them around without costing too much on their roster. And because here's the other thing, when a guy can play those different roles, that means that you could, if they can take on a depth chart spot, that means that you can then, um, you can then free up another spot so that you can get another player in another area. Let's say, like you know, for example, the Steelers really want to have six cornerbacks, but you have a safety who doubles as a cornerback, and you're like, well, we'll keep, we'll, we'll, we'll keep five, five corners in the, in the. Uh, uh, coming out of training camp, we'll just have one of our one of our our safeties kind of be that sixth option there, and then that gives us space to maybe have another wide receiver, have another offensive lineman, defensive lineman, linebacker, whatever. Whatever. I think that that is a big part of what the future is becoming in the NFL is looking for players who can do things like that for you on the field. And I think if you look at the guys on the Steelers defense that they kind of pushed aside, like guys like Tyson Alulu, Art Millette, uh, Akella Witherspoon, Rob Spillane. These were guys that were only good at one thing. I think that is sort of the, the the theme there. And if you look at the guys that they've brought in instead, I think you have a lot more versatility in the pieces that they've brought in. And I think that is a big part of what they're trying to do on defense. And again, I don't think it's positionless, but I think it does make the it blurs the lines between what is a strong safety and a linebacker, what is a defensive end versus defensive tackle. Uh, like I think it 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 tortures the terminology, but mm-hmm. I think it's still football. I don't think we're reinventing jobs. I, I think we're just assigning them in somewhat non-traditional ways. 
I hear you. I think it's a great way to end this conversation because there's a lot more to discover and a lot more to study as far as how NFL teams advance their plans moving forward. He's Alan Saunders of SteelersNow.com. Alan, thanks so much for joining us here in the Locked on Steelers podcast. Let people know they can find you, follow you, and get more of your work. That was some upper level football talk right there. That was some great that stuff. Great like, I, stuff. I love letting us go and do that kind of stuff. If you, if you guys let, let love that too, please let us know in the comment section or rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and give us and make that your comment. I like doing that kind of stuff. That's why I like having you on the show, Alan. Steelersnow.com at PGH Steelers now at a Saunders underscore PGH right there. Uh, just wrote about how I think the Steelers need to be thinking about drafting a replacement for Cam Hayward. Um and, and not necessarily a one-to-run replacement, like Bob, I can get out of here, but looking at that sort of Philadelphia Eagles model and what has allowed guys like Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox to have long careers and still be successful deep into their 30s, that's because they had young guys coming in behind them. So um, they were mocked to a 20 from the four defensive lineman this week by Jordan Reed of ESPN, so that's what kind of sparked that. But um, that's interesting to me. And this time of year is when they start looking at who they're going to be scouting this year. So it's, it's not – Look, it's July. There's not that much to talk about, but that is a thing to talk about. <laughs> Listen, Alan, I think you missed a very obvious answer to your question there as far as who's, who would replace Cam Hayward. I'm right here, baby. <laughs> I live right in Pittsburgh. All I got to do is walk on over. No one would know the difference when they look at Chris Carter and Cam Hayward. Until, anyway, you, I'm, until, until you got out there in the field. Then, then yeah, they would, yeah, when I'm not 6'5 and 300 pounds. <laughs> Just shout out to all my people that say I look like Cam Hayward. But anyways, I'm Chris Carter, host of the Locked on Steelers podcast. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Carter Critiques. You can read my work at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, where I cover the University of Pittsburgh. And I also host the North Shore Drive podcast. Check all that out there. But check out this show, the Locked on Steelers podcast, on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube, Monday through Friday. Like, subscribe. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to this channel. You get all of those Monday through Friday episodes, as well as our bonus content. Back tomorrow with more Pittsburgh Steelers talk right here on the Locked on Steelers podcast.